live streaming is on. So hopefully that will work. So I, so so Kim, first, you know, thank you for joining us at Mercivity 2023, IEEE Mercivity 2023. Um, my first, uh, my first thought is I, I, I really want to thank you. Uh, for Recording your is on. At, at at MIT, uh, and and that was really nice to have you you. Um, uh, to to you, I, thank you for inviting me to speak at MIT. And I've always been inspired by your work uh, for many years. I've followed your work because I build underwater musical instruments, underwater pipe organs called hydrolophones. And so your work has been a major source of inspiration. A lot of your papers on, on vortex shedding on cylindrical bodies, a lot of under, uh, wires under the ocean, how they vibrate. And I, I know a lot of your work is concerned with suppressing the vibrations in, in wires underwater because the vibrations often create problems uh, right. Whereas for me, vibrations is, are music to my ears, and of course, I'm always looking for ways to get wires to sing when wa when water's flowing through them. Carbon vortex shedding on bluff bodies, and you know, give me a cylinder with a strule number of 0 0.18, and uh, I'll be happy. That's my happy space, you know. With uh, All right. With well, I was, you know, the earliest um, references to vortex shedding and those kinds of things were aeolian tones yes <laughs> yes go right back to the origins of it and right. we're now we're going full circle back to to um uh on the broader picture what we hope to do with mercivity is create a nexus of nature you know earth the environment what we call the world made of atoms alpha technology, the world made of bits, beta, and humanity, the world made of genes, gamma, alpha, beta, and gamma together, sort of the three circles of the Venn diagram is immersivity. Um, <clears throat> and at MIT, we often talk about atoms and bits, uh, and like the physical and the virtual, mens a manus, mind and hand, the physical and virtual. We talk about uh, for years back in the early 1990s when I was at MIT working with Charles Wyckoff and others, we often, and you, um, uh, we often talked about uh, atoms and bits, you know, the, the physical computing, I guess we would call it that. And, and I know the Edgerton Center went through all these changes with, uh, um, I remember coming in there and just really, it was so beautiful to see all the artifacts exactly as, and I'd spent so, many hours documenting everything exactly the way Harold Edgerton left it. But I know you and I uh, got together and it was kind of a combination of sadness at, at seeing the old go and, and maybe the joy of welcoming some new things, um, kind of uh, getting uh, the computation into the Edgerton Center. Um, maybe you can speak a little bit about how the Edgerton Center evolved from, say, a very physical place to a place that combines, say, computers with physicality, alpha and beta atoms and bits, if you will. Hmm. I haven't thought much about that. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think mostly bringing in, you know, computation and those kind of things comes through the doorway of the students and the people you're working with. So uh, uh, you were you were there with your wearable wearable computing and things like that, and there were other students who came in and. As technologies became available, everything from, you know, cell phones to Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. So these things really very much came through, came in with the students. They were, they were always the ones that were interested in the latest stuff. <laughs> yeah. See, as a student coming in to me, I was fascinated with both the old and the new. I was fascinated by Harold Edgerton's artifacts. I remember... Charles Wyckoff, when he, uh, uh, before he died, I remember he gave me all his lab equipment and I'm saying, oh, why are you giving this to me? Aren't you gonna need it? And then it was with great sadness that I read of, of his passing uh, uh, later on. And, and um, uh, it was sort of, uh, I remember when you were cleaning up and everything and getting rid of all that old stuff and you gave me that uh, uh, shelf, you know, that was, it actually had, has written on the side of it, you know, Edgerton and like it's got it's sort of all this memorabilia. Yeah. It was absolutely There's wonderful. A lot of stuff. There were hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of items that were 
that were cataloged and sent off to the MIT Museum. And then we still kept discovering new ones years later. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I remember all the old power supplies that got thrown away. I, I, mm -hmm. uh, as they were being piled up for the trash, I grabbed the one that was in the best condition and I carefully carried it over yeah. to the MIT Media Lab and I hid it underneath the floorboards to preserve it uh, <laughs> with all the dust, being careful not to disturb any of the dust off of it, you know, just to keep it absolutely pristine. And uh, one of the uh, things yeah. that I found, Doctor, you know, Doc was a pack rat too. He, yes. he kept cool stuff. And one thing I discovered after uh, uh, after a few years that was on the shelf somehow got missed is was a thing about the size of a little bit you know bigger about the size of a small coffee can, and it had an air port on it and it and on the top of it it had a multi-sided rotating mirror. And then I read the label on it and it said. Uh, made for A.A. A. Michelson by the Sperry Gyroscope Company. So <laughs> this, you know, the Michelson-Morley measurements of the speed of light, you know, were done by reflect, by uh, send, sending beam. Yeah, light. the interferometer, the, the, the Michelson interferometer. Right, and came back, but then it was on a high-speed rotating mirror so that, uh, you know, you could measure the 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 uh basically the round trip time uh and so evidently they had made a number of copies of that michelson rotating mirror this thing had a tr air turbine in it and you put a high pressure air source on it and it would spin up that turbine to high speed driving the mirror and so evidently they made a few extras of these so that people could go out and try to reproduce the experiment and somehow Edgerton ended up with one. So to this day, I still have that rotating mirror sitting on the sitting on the shelf up at the Edgerton Center. Yeah, that is that's so cool. It is such a beautiful place. It's truly a magical place because it embraces the old and the new. You know, the the where we've been and where we're going. And and I always felt that the the to see the future, you need to see the past. And it really is at the nexus of uh, uh, of nature, technology, and humanity. Mm. It does really bring together the three circles. So we had a student that first a student, and then he and he was a TA for the high the the uh, high speed photo course that was called Strobe Project Lab. That I that's when I got to know Doc as I took that course from him in uh, 19, the spring of 1972. So we still teach that course. One of our TAs was a kid named Kyle Hounsell, and he he and Jim Bales worked together to take a number of, uh, a lot of neat, neat photographs. And one of the things he did for me though, um, and this was, you know, students knowing how to do new technologies, is for some reason I'd gotten involved in designing a potato cannon. Oh, yes. <laughs> and we built a couple of potato cannons as student kind of projecty things, but we really wanted to me measure the velocity of the potato coming out of the can't coming out of the muzzle. And so Kyle and I came up with a, a, a time gate where we had a couple of, of uh, light path sensors and the potato would, you know, go through the time time gate and you'd measure the duration of time and record the event and anyway he wired all that up with an arduino and we measured potato characteristics oh that is so cool well it's it, still on the shelf upstairs it was a pretty good pretty good potato can i built a lot of bad bad ones and this was a really good one <laughs> well just getting students to build things getting physical that was the problem when i came to mit in 1991 it was all computers, you know, the computer yeah. lab was full of computers and there, and there, there was no physicality, you know, there, yeah. so I remember I spent so much of my time at the Edgerton Center because it brought to me the physicality that I was missing from right. the media lab. Well, and that's, that was really the purpose of the Edgerton Center. When I wrote the proposal to the provost that we should take Doc's lab and we should use it to support students who wanted to work on real stuff. And yeah. They, 
things outside of the classroom. So that's where yeah. that's where students with you know their own ideas and creative and things that they wanted to do, they could have a place to pursue it. And that's turned out to be really quite successful. Yeah, the whole idea of being outside the classroom, the whole idea of thinking outside the classroom is very Edgertonian because you look at that big picture of him on his yacht there, you know, he's really in his happy place working with Jacques Cousteau and doing research out on the water, out in the ocean. Uh, right. All of you, you and him, all the oceans people are very physical. We often talk about water, human computer interaction, water HCI. Because if you look at the three circles of the Venn diagram, planet Earth is blue, the blue circle. But that's mm -hmm. largely water, really, in many ways. Right. So we think about water technology and humanity. And <clears throat> I think of, of Harold Edgerton <clears throat> as really embracing this idea of taking the university out of the buildings. That's kind of what I did is because for me, my body, my, my clothes my own self, what I call the environment, which is the boundary between what's around me and the and and me myself, the environment. The environment is the boundary between the environment and the environment. And you know, like clothing, cars, vehicles, vessels, these are all environments. And right. as a environmentalist, i.e. somebody concerned with the boundary between the environment and the environment, I see uh, Edgerton's work is pioneering, and yours as well, pioneering these concept of environmentalism uh, uh, concepts, like like um, taking work, like when you're out on the ocean, it's 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 research in in situ. It's it's not in a, you know, it's fine to do it in a lab. When I started at MIT, everybody said, oh, what you're doing is a waste of time. You know, you should do controlled lab experiments. You can't get any control over what you're doing out in the field wearing these technologies, you should be doing that in, in a lab. And and uh, at the time, they didn't really appreciate the notion of internal validity versus external validity for experiments. And mm -hmm. I think Her you and Harold uh, embraced something that the rest of MIT took a long time to catch up with, like the Media Lab eventually. Now there's there's a whole, when Neil Gershenfeld was brought into the lab, it was largely in response, I think, to what was happening at the Edgerton Center, what we were doing, because I was running around doing all this stuff with my own body as a lab, and I was spending probably more time at the Edgerton Center than in the media lab. Right. And eventually the media lab caught up with the idea and said, hey, wait a minute, we can't stop this wearables research. Uh, first, they tried to stop me from doing it. And, <laughs> and then... Uh, they finally realized that, yeah, we got to have physicality, you know, and so now there's making, there's bits and atoms, Center for Bits and Atoms is really largely, I think, a result of your and and uh, Charlie Wyckoff and Harold Edgerton and Jack Cousteau's work. Mm. Yeah, it was, uh, of course, it, when I was Edgerton's TA exactly 50 years ago now. <laughs> wow. And I regret, I'd be sitting in the uh, sitting at my desk in the lab, grading lab books and stuff like that. And Doc would walk over and say, "Hey, Kim, come over to my office. I want you to meet somebody." And you'd need to walk over, and it'd be Jacques Cousteau. And so you'd hang out with Jacques Cousteau for a while. <laughs> so Cousteau, Ed Land, you know, quite a variety of people that Doc uh, Doc entertained. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just amazing the work that he did in nature, you know, at, at the nexus of of water, humans, and technology. Uh, in many ways, he was a pioneer of this water HCI stuff. Well, he, uh, I think one of the things that he it did was enable a lot of other people to also do good work. Like uh, there was a photographer named Nina Lean, I think. And she, oh, yes. she's the one who he equipped with equipment and went out and took lots of pictures of bats. And so she's got, there's a great, she published a book, all sorts of bat pictures, including, you know, uh, bats catching prey off the surface of the water, you know, and just flying along and scooping up prey right off the surface. She did some beautiful work. And then, uh, Doc also worked with, uh, Crawford Greenwald, who was the president of DuPont, 
and his hobby was taking pictures of hummingbirds. And so Doc set him up with early portable equipment and he went off to South America and Central America and then self-published his own book on humming color photos of hummingbirds. It was just fantastic. So Doc enabled a lot of nice work like that. Yeah, he was very much in the <clears throat> him and you and 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 uh, Charles Wyckoff were very much in the real world of um, of connecting human you know humanity uh, again kind of at the nexus of, of of you know technology that's that's for the natural world and for mm -hmm. humanity. Yep, one of them, you know, I've always enjoyed some of those movies that Doc made. One of the favorites being the uh, uh, time-lapse photography of what was going on in a uh, in a cove in the ocean about a couple of meters below the surface in, in a 24-hour time-lapse. And you can see the sand dollars and the, and the uh, lobster and the starfish scurrying around. And it was, it was a, just a great Doc doc uh, venture you know uh, in into the water with one of his cameras and and using his flash flash technology and underwater camera technology yeah i, I i've always felt that the world needs a <clears throat> a kind of uh um <clears throat> the, the world needs like a water human technology nexus kind of like a like a place to celebrate that I, I i know here in ontario we have the world's largest freshwater lake lake ontario mm -hmm. and uh our great lakes here in you know in ontario uh, were on the great lakes in fact toronto is the largest city that's on the great lakes <clears throat> it's also the capital of ontario Mm -hmm. And so we've got the, the Great Lakes hold about 21% of the world's freshwater supply, about 80% of North yeah. America's freshwater. Yeah. So it kind of makes sense that we, of all people, would be stewards of freshwater ecosystems. And, and so I've often said and felt that Toronto is water capital of the world. <laughs> and um, also, when you look at cyborgs, you know, Manfred Kleins coined the term cyborg, you know, and he said person riding a bicycle is his favorite example of a nexus between human and machine. But bicycles have only been around for 200 years. I, I felt that vessels have been around for more than a million years, longer than the invention of the wheel, longer than the invention mm -hmm. of clothing, even before Homo sapiens. And so I felt that vessels are the true cyborg people, uh, those on vessels are true cyborgs in the and in fact, if you look at the Greek word cybernetic, cyborg is a portmanteau of cybernetic and organism, cybernetic organism. And the Greek word cybernetic in Greek means rudder or helmsman. So the true cyborg literally to the true definition of the word is a person on a vessel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so Harold Edgerton <coughs> was a true cyborg <laughs> bringing technology and, and humanity and nature together. And so I, I, I feel really if there's going to be a place that brings nature, technology, and humanity together around water and freshwater stewardship, it wants to be centered in Toronto, the largest city on the Great Lakes. And it wants to be uh, probably at Ontario Place, which is Toronto's only, downtown Toronto's really only access to freshwater. Mm -hmm. we, we have a beach here that's Pebble Beach. It was designed 52 years ago by Michael Hoff using pebbles. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought that, because when everybody, and anyone says a beach, they say, let's bring in some sand to make a beach. Well, he brought in pebbles and he made it with pebbles instead of sand. Mm -hmm. Now, that the, an interesting side effect of that is it's a super ultra clean beach because there's no grit or grime or mud or dirt. Yeah. So you can throw a bilge pump in the water and do a scientific experiment on sound propagation through water. Like I'm putting my hydrolophone underwater and moving it around to measure the sound. We did that in the Charles. And um, in the in the, with the Pebble Beach, there's no sand to clog up the works, if you will. And it, it right. makes it very ideal for research and scientific mm -hmm. exploration. Mm -hmm. So I was almost wanted to say this beach is a is a place of important scientific research because it's now under threat of development and we're trying to save this beach. All right. And 
I guess you and Harold probably uh, were great stewards of the environment because raising awareness of all these birds and wildlife and, and all of what, what, what you've been doing has in many ways, uh, I could say that you're saviors of the earth in some way. <laughs> I don't know. That's a, that's a stretch, I think, but I do appreciate wildlife. My, uh, my wife was a, is a biologist and um, her uh, research animal a long time ago was a snapping turtle. She was studying immunology, uh, but, and so she's been the la neighborhood expert on the local snapping turtles for a long time. So we had one show up on our porch yesterday, a little one about two years old. So uh, that was, uh, we took great joy in that. So he's parked in a little, uh, terrarium right now for a couple of days so we can get a good look at him before we turn him loose. Oh, that's or super cool. Loose. Oh, that's really awesome. You know, connecting to the, to the natural world around us. Sure. So I, I wonder, uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts on this, like, We'd love to get your involvement. We've got the president of the IEEE Standards Association, mm -hmm. the most powerful person in the world in terms of setting standards. And uh, IEEE is known for standards like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, so yeah. many of the standards we use. <laughs> so him and I are, are together putting this immersivity, as well as some other people. I wonder if we could get your uh, involvement in this in some capacity, maybe as an advisor or something like that. Sure. If it you know, whatever makes sense, not do anything foolish where it doesn't make sense. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. We're looking to put together. Uh, so we're, we're presenting on the, uh, in Ottawa this weekend at mm -hmm. the IEEE Sections Congress. This is the uh, world's largest technical society, IEEE. Every three years, they have a big conference of conferences, mm -hmm. if you will, the Sections Congress, which is the... At the IEEE, we have conferences all over the world, conferences and symposia right. and, and meetups and so on. And then uh, every three years, we have this big sections congress. And so we're putting forward this idea of the, the mercivity um, as kind of a university. We're, we're loosely, um, I've kind of been calling it UOP, you know, like University of Ontario place, uh, UOP as in kind of like grow up or photo op or you yeah. know um and uh, the idea is it's a university uh in the physical world outdoors at a beach an outdoor uh coastal or or shoreline an outdoor shoreline university located right on the shoreline and um i'm sure you could probably speak to the to the merits of that you know getting people a it's fun to be at the beach what better place to learn than what we call teach beach outdoor classroom and 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 secondly i think it it uh it connects people to nature to be in nature while learning about nature yeah so i have my own phd work for five years i i spent all every summer down at woods hole because i was part of the mit woods hole joint program so my actual phd is in oceanographic engineering so yeah <laughs> yeah a lot of your work is really really connected to the environment and to to reality in a sense because uh, i think when i'm reading your papers like on 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 vortex shedding on on uh, ocean on mm -hmm. cables under the ocean and things like that a lot of uh, the depth and of understanding that your work goes into, I think, comes from its connection to physical reality. Like your contemporaries have tried to address vortex shedding on bluff bodies and all that kind of stuff. But I think your work stands out partly because it's really grounded in some way in, in, in reality. Yeah, well, we did a lot of field experiments. and There are not many people in the that, uh, that do that these days. So I had the benefit of starting off that way. My first year as a faculty member, I was out in the field up in Castine, Maine, uh, putting a big cable across a, 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 between the island and the mainland. And as the tide came in, then it, that's, that was our first observations and real measurements of flow-induced vibration. Yeah, so yeah. That's the very, very first summer I joined the faculty. So that was how it, and I never, 
that was my first experiment in that air field and I never actually got away from it. I've been doing things in structural vibration in the ocean ever since. Well, flow induced vibration is, is, uh, is a really important field to me uh, because uh, you know, one of my childhood hobbies and fascinations was building underwater musical instruments. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I've got now, I've had quite a few students further this work. One of my students, Ryan Jansen, he did his master's with me and stayed for a PhD on flow-induced vibration. Uh, but uh, uh, rather than doing it in the ocean, of course, we, we, we did it inside a musical instrument yeah. at a very small scale. And so uh, we made these things, we call them carmonizers. They're like uh, harmonizers for music that use carmen vortex shedding. Yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah, good. And uh, and so he he really studied that crazy at depth. And we've got these some very very sophisticated designs that have a laminarizer that takes the uh, when the flow comes in that goes through a venturi, and then there's the side discharge to an underwater whistle that that uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, when you block the water jet from the top, it pushes it up through the underwater whistle, and then goes into an exhaust manifold, and then. He's got the exhaust manifold designed in such a way that it it uh, mitigates air bubbles that might have gotten in uh, on the input side and manages the exhaust so it doesn't back feed from the exhaust into the hydrolophone jet. Because yeah. when you get a single tiny little air bubble in the hydrolophone, it's like a like spit in a trumpet. <laughs> well, it changes the speed of sound in water, which uh, is a major disruption. Doesn't take much in the way of bubbles. Well, one little bubble in the instrument goes so flat that it drops into the subsonic range. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's all about bulk modulus. Yeah, yeah. So it 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 it, it, it it's fascinating to see this this nexus of 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 nature, technology, and humanity uh, in 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 your work and in, in what the Edgerton Center is today. I was really delighted to be mentoring those students. I took them down to the uh, yeah. Same they had program. a good time. That was fun, and uh, we had we had fun getting that hydrolophone down the ramp there, and and getting uh, have some fun. We had a good swim in the Charles, some of us as well too. Oh, is that right? <laughs> That's uh, good. You know, towing different stuff around. I've got a little tow float to tow around and measure water quality as I pull it through the water. And, yeah, you know, those, the students uh, uh, in the engineering design workshop. That was those are the students that you met there mostly high school students. One group of them just finished their project the other day and they had set up a towed array that they could uh, uh, pull around in the Charles River and measure, you know, pressure and temperature, et cetera. They, were at it. they had a really good time. Yeah. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And it, 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 it's been a real honor to, to have you uh, welcome me into, into your world. And, and uh, we, we would love to we're we're looking forward to your your advisor ship on on where we're going in the future. Well, if I can be helpful, that'd be good. But uh, let's not 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 force it into things I know nothing about. Yeah, yeah, it's more just kind of the experience that you've had trying to uh, organize all these things, getting the students in, and and having meaningful student interaction. Mm -hmm. What we hope what we hope to do here at Teach Beach. UOP, as we call it, University of Ontario place, is is sort of build a, a lab. I've been having all my office hours at the beach pretty much. Like if anyone wants to meet me, I just tell them to come on down to the beach because I'm there pretty much every day. Good. And and I've got all my test equipment. I got a lock-in amplifier. I had a custom-built lock-in amplifier uh, that I designed and, and uh, had a company make uh, with me that will measure multiple components it's, and aggregate multiple frequency components, multiple harmonics. So I can photograph underwater sound waves uh, in a way that shows all their harmonic content. Hmm. So you know how a normal lock-in amplifier only lets through one frequency, what it's tuned to, whereas like an older lock-in amplifier, you probably remember the PAR124A lock-in amplifier, for example. Princeton Applied Research, and there's a lot of EG and G uh, overlap with lock and amplifiers. There's two yeah. PAR124A lock and amplifiers, one handling the real part of the signal and the other handling the imaginary part of the yeah. signal. Yeah. 
And uh, uh, they, what's interesting or fascinating uh, in my childhood, I was playing around with those, uh, is that uh, they use square waves instead of sine wave multiplying. So they do polarity reversal alternately to lock in on something. Uh huh. And as a result, since the reference signal is a square wave, it lets through a little bit of harmonics. And yeah. originally that was seen as a flaw. But to me, that's a, a feature because uh, we can use that to aggregate harmonics and lock in on something that has harmonic content, like say a sound wave from a musical instrument has yeah. various harmonics. So then I would photograph these sound waves of musical instruments um, with all their harmonics present. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, oh, well, how can I make it come through equally weighted instead of, because a square wave reference signal uh, lets the harmonics through in a way that, uh, you know, the first harmonic gets full strength and then the third harmonic is a third strength and the, the fifth harmonic, yeah. is, so the next harmonic is, you know, they fall off. So I said, well, what if we, what if I make the a stream make the reference signal a stream of narrow pulses? So I built a sonar that uses uh, as its lock-in amplifier, as its homodyne receiver, a, a series of very narrow pulses, uh, which means that it lets through all frequencies equally, approximately as the pulse width decreases in the limit, uh, so that it it you have homodyne sonar receiver that will let through all the harmonics equally, and then all of a sudden I can see and photograph sound waves underwater, for example. Right, right. All right, sounds good. I've got a, I, I've got a lunch meeting I have to go to pretty soon. Um, don't know if you have any other burning questions you need to get out. Yeah, maybe. How would we collect? What's the best way to collaborate with your world? Like, say, Woods Hole. Uh, can you... Can you help us connect there? Uh, Not really. My my I, my direct connections there. Most of them have retired and moved on, and I haven't done my work myself at Woods Hole in a very long time. So, uh, yeah, I would be cold calling at the moment at this point. Who else might we connect with? Who would who would be other good people to connect with? Well, all right. What what are you thinking about? Are you doing? Uh, oceanography, or you think it'd be, or geology, or biology. Well, we're, sort of, we're based on a freshwater lake, so mm -hmm. our 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 interest probably is, shall we say, being freshwater research capital of the world, uh, creating a an organization or a, an institute or a, an entity of some kind that is uh, that concerns itself, I suppose, with with uh, uh, nature, technology, humanity around water, mm -hmm. uh, particularly around fresh water and, um, you know, getting, uh, building sort of a world-class university outdoors in nature mm -hmm. on the, on the freshwater coast, yeah, or freshwater uh, shoreline. Well, I think my, you know, you know, the, 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 the people who are most aligned with that are ones who are concerned with environmental preservation and things like that so there's a lot of organizations of that kind yeah especially, especially in a, you know and also around clean water native yeah. native americans are uh, are an interesting resource in that category yeah yeah is there anyone in your circle of connections who who might really click with this stuff mm, uh not directly uh yeah. yeah, yeah, kind of, you know, modern day Leonardo da Vinci style thinkers, creative people. I know uh, it was interesting. Uh, Ed, you know, really has a has his, has a passion. You know, he he's really a right. Um, got a fire in his heart for teaching and stuff like that. Yeah, he does it. Does it that he was just waving through my window a second ago, see if I seeing if I was available. I had to wave him off. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, tell me, where do you think, where do you see Edgerton Center going in the next while? What are your next big moves? What, what, what would you like to see happen in the next uh, 
Well, I'm in the uh, I'm involved in expanding maker resources at MIT in a big way right now. We're renovating that big metropolitan storage building and putting in a 15,000 square foot maker space there. So three years from now, when we open that, we'll have a lot more maker resources. So that's one of the things that's going on. But also probably in the next few years, I'm thinking about I need to think about re retirement, but I'm not rushing towards it, but I think a little bit about it from day to day. So uh, I need to think, I need to be thinking about uh, succession plans and, you know, who, somebody, another faculty member who would like to be able to have a good, you know, enjoy engaging with students in the Edgerton Center. Cool. Cool. That sounds like, uh, sounds like a lot of fun. Do you know what you want to do in, in, in retirement? Have you given that some thought? Not really, because I'm. that's why I haven't retired, is I still kind of enjoy an MIT-centered uh, life and having a place like the Edgerton Center where I can it, it work with bright students and support n new stuff. And, you know, if I sat home with nothing, I, know, I don't know what I'd do if I just sat at home. Yeah, like, would you envision yourself maybe if you are retiring, you'd probably retire uh, in in the same near MIT so that you could remain connected? Oh, yeah. I suppose. yeah, there's not enough to do just sitting around the house, you know. I got yeah, I want to be you know engaged with interesting people and students and fun projects, and so that keeps you go that keeps you you know stimulated and and uh, enjoying life. Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, we shall right. stay in touch and, yeah. uh, can you send me a, a picture or brief bio or something like that as for me? Scientific? Yeah, sure. I'll see what I can dig up. Cool. All right. Great. Good to talk to you, Steve. Talk okay. To you All right. Bye-bye. I'll talk to you soon. So now... I just need to go here and I need to go to there.